Well, hello, dear friends. In this series, we are going to study 18 presentations of the state of the dead. This is a vitally important subject in these last days because Satan will use misconceptions concerning the state of the dead to deceive almost the whole world. There are in Scripture some difficult passages when it comes to the state of the dead, which, according to the Apostle Peter, the untaught and unstable peoples twist to their own destruction. 2 Peter 3 and verse 16. I highly suggest that you purchase a copy of the study notes that go along with this presentation. They will greatly help you grasp what we are studying. In fact, you can study each presentation in advance, and after the presentation, you can review it. Just contact us at Secrets Unsealed or at some TV, and you will be able to purchase a copy of the study notes. The title of our first presentation is The Right to the Tree of Life. But before we begin, we want to have a word of prayer. So I invite you to bow your heads wherever you are reverently as we ask the Lord's presence. Father in heaven, we come before you today with humility of heart. We know that there are many texts of Scripture that we must struggle with. You're not to blame. The writers are not to blame. But we are because we don't dedicate enough diligence to studying these texts within their context. So be with us as we begin this series. Give us clear minds to understand and give us open hearts to receive. Thank you, Father, for the promise of your presence, and we claim that promise in the precious and holy name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We can't speak about death unless we first of all speak about life. So we're going to talk first of all about the origin of life. And for this we go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. I'm reading from the New King James Version. So notice the physical aspect of man is composed of the dust of the ground or clay. And then God gave that body of clay or of dust the capacity to breathe the breath of life. And man became a living being. In the King James it says man became a living soul. So God did not give man a soul. Man does not have a soul. According to Genesis 2 and verse 7, man is a soul. The person is the soul. The breath plus the body equals soul. We understand this by looking at two verses in the New Testament, and as we compare them, we notice that the soul is the person itself. Let's read Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. Here Jesus spoke the following words, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, when we compare the same teaching of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verse 25, we notice that the word soul is substituted with the word himself. In other words, the soul is the self, the person. Notice Luke chapter 9 and verse 25. The same teaching of Jesus parallel in another Gospel. It says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost. Did you notice that? In the King James Version, in Matthew 16, 26, it speaks about losing one's soul. In Luke chapter 9, verse 25, it speaks about man losing himself. So the soul is the person, the soul is the self, the soul is the individual, the combination of body of clay and breath. 
Now let's take a look at man's original condition as God created him. God created a perfect body, put man in a perfect environment with perfect laws of health, and God placed in the midst of the garden a tree, the tree of life, to sustain the life of man. Let's read about it in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll talk about the knowledge of good and evil, that tree, a little bit later. But notice that God placed in the midst of the garden the tree of life. And man had to eat from the tree of life to continue living. The life of man was contingent. It was dependent upon eating from the tree that God placed in the garden. Man's life was not inherent and independent. The tree was like a battery charger, if you please. The immortality of man depended on eating from the tree, and the right to eat from the tree was conditional upon obedience to God's command. Ellen White confirmed what we found already in Genesis 2 verse 9. I read now from Testimonies for the Church, volume 8, page 288. The fruit of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden possessed supernatural virtue. So the tree itself had supernatural virtue. She continues, to eat of it, we're going to notice in the next statement that it wasn't only eating once, it was continually eating. But once again, the fruit of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden possessed supernatural virtue. To eat of it was to live forever. Its fruit was the antidote of death. Its leaves were for the sustaining of life and immortality. In another statement that we find in that magnificent book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 60, she wrote, in order to possess an endless existence, man must continue to partake of the tree of life. Notice it wasn't only eating once and you're immortal. No, he had to continue eating from the tree. She continues in this statement, Deprived of this, man's vitality would gradually diminish until life should become extinct. Very, very clear, right? In order to possess an endless existence, man must continue to partake of the tree of life. Deprived of this, his vitality would gradually diminish. In other words, his battery would lose its charge. And she says that life would become extinct. The Baptist theologian by the name of Wheeler Robinson, who was an Old Testament scholar, agreed with both Genesis 2.9 and Ellen White when he wrote the following words. Paul conceived man to be mortal by his original nature. So man was not made immortal. Man was mortal by his original nature. And then he continues, but with the prospect of immortality. This, however, he forfeited when he was driven forth from Eden, and therefore from the tree of life, which would have nourished immortality in him, thus came death through sin. Absolutely clear from this Baptist theologian, very well known Wheeler Robinson. So we notice then that God placed the tree of life in the midst of the garden, Adam and Eve and their descendants would have had to continue eating from the tree, and as they continued eating from the tree, their battery would become continually charged, and they would continue their endless existence. But their endless existence depended on obedience to God's command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now that we've studied about death, about life, let's go and take a look at what the Bible has to say about death. And of course, we go to Genesis, where death originates in this world. Let's go to Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17. 
Here we find God's command to Adam and Eve to abstain eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is what it says. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So God not only placed the tree of life in the midst of the garden, He also placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And He commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if they did, they would die. So if they could die, they were not immortal by nature. Now, Satan contradicted what God said. Satan told Eve, and then Eve told Adam, that they would not die if they ate from that tree. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4. This is Satan's first great deception in human history. This is what he said in Genesis 3 verse 4. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. So God had said, You will surely die if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan says, You will not surely die. In other words, God is lying to you. You will live forever if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because Satan is saying to Adam and Eve, you are by nature immortal. So we're told in Genesis that both Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate from the forbidden tree. Let's read Genesis 3 and verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So they ate from the forbidden tree. And therefore now the Bible tells us that they were going to die. In Genesis 3.19, God pronounced the sentence upon man. This is what he said. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you, notice it doesn't say, till your body return to the ground. That's not what it says. It says, till you return to the ground. So once again, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, it doesn't say your body is dust, no, it says you are dust, Adam, and to dust you shall return. It doesn't say here that the soul would go to heaven and that the body would go to dust. Three times in this verse we find God saying, you to Adam and what was going to happen to him. Now, because Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree, now God barred them from eating from the tree of life. Let's read about it in Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And we noticed already that they had to continue eating from the tree. Verse 23 Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim, that those are angels, the highest of angels, he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. In other words, God placed angels to guard the tree of life so that Adam and Eve and their descendants could not eat from the tree of life, continue eating from the tree of life, and live forever. Thus, human beings no longer had access to the tree of life. So to speak, they could no longer recharge their battery. Furthermore, they lived in an ever-deteriorating environment and intemperate personal habits wore down the battery faster. 
Human beings, as I mentioned, had to continue eating from the tree of life to continue living forever. Now here's the question. If man was immortal by nature, what good would it do for God to forbid them from eating from the tree that gave eternal life? If they already had immortality, what good would it be for God to forbid them from eating from the tree? Clearly, they could only be immortal by continuing to eat from the tree. They were not by nature immortal. And then we want to notice another very important point. If Adam and Eve were immortal when God created them, why would Jesus need to die to give them immortality if they already had it? You see, these are important questions. If God created Adam and Eve immortal, why would Jesus have to come to die to give human beings immortality if they already had it by nature? Now let's take a look at the lifespans of those who lived before the worldwide flood in the days of Noah. In the beginning, God gave man a fully charged battery, if you please. During the first 1600 years of human history, men lived long lives. Let me just mention them. Adam lived 930 years. Seth lived 912 years. Enosh lived 905 years. Canaan lived 910. Mahalalel lived 895. Jared lived 962. Enoch, by the way, was translated to heaven from among the living. He did not die. Methuselah died when he was 969. Lamech died when he was 777. And Noah died when he was 950 years old. Yet eventually, after a long time, the battery wore down. And because there was no access to the battery charger, so to speak, every single one of those individuals died. So to speak, the Energizer Bunny eventually does run out of juice. Ellen White explained why the people before the flood lived such long lives. In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 988, she wrote the following words. As Adam and Eve ate of this tree, they acknowledged their dependence upon God. In other words, every time that Adam and Eve ate from the tree, they were saying, we are dependent on the life that God gives us. We don't have inherent life. She continues, the tree of life possessed the power to perpetuate life. And as long as they ate of it, they could not die. The lives of the antediluvians, that means those who lived before the flood, the lives of the antediluvians were protra protracted, in other words, long, because of the life-giving power of this tree, which was transmitted to them from Adam and Eve. You see, those who lived before the flood, they were closer to the time that they had a fully charged battery. That's why they lived so much longer. Ellen White also wrote about the longevity and health of the people who lived before the flood. This statement is Fundamentals of Christian Education, pages 22 and 23. It's a magnificent statement. This is what she wrote. The book of Genesis gives quite a definite account of social and individual life. And yet we have no record of an infant being born blind, deaf, crippled, deformed, or imbecile. There is not an instance upon record of a natural death in infancy, childhood, or early manhood. There is no account of men and women dying of disease. Obituary notices in the book of Genesis run thus, And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Then she continues, God endowed man with so great vital force, by the way, that's the battery, the battery that God gave us, the vital energy that God originally gave Adam and Eve, God endowed man with so great vital force that he has withstood the accumulation of disease brought upon the race in consequences of perverted, perverted appetites 
and has continued for 6,000 years. This fact of itself is enough to evidence to us the strength and electrical energy that God gave to man at His creation. <laughs> Imagine 20 times the vital energy that we have today God gave to Adam and Eve. Ellen White continues, It took more than 2,000 years of crime and indulgence of base passions to bring bodily disease upon the race to any great extent. If Adam at his creation had not been endowed with 20 times as much vital force as men now have, the race, with their present habits of living in violation of natural law, would have become extinct. And so Genesis tells us that those who lived before the flood lived long, long lives. They were closer to the battery charger, no mention of disease, no mention of people dying of cancer or dying of pneumonia or dying of COVID-19, no mention. And yet we are told in harmony with God, what God had said that every person in this list that is given in Genesis chapter 5 died with the exception, of course, of Enoch, who the Bible says was translated to heaven from among the living. God was proved true and Satan was proved false. God had said, if you eat from the tree, you will surely die. Satan said, no, you're immortal. You're by nature immortal. You can eat from the tree and you can still live forever. God was right. Romans 6 verse 23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. And in chapter 5 verse 12 of Romans, the apostle Paul wrote that no one in this world can escape the sentence of death. It says there in Romans 5 verse 12, therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Death is the result of sin. There was no death before sin. We need to understand that. The evolutionary theory says that there was death long before sin. The Bible teaches that death came in as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve, and death transposed itself to all human beings on this earth. Now what about the lifespans of those who lived between the flood and the days of Abraham? According to Genesis 11, the lifespan of those who lived between the flood and the time of Abraham was significantly reduced. Let me give you the figures. Shem lived 600 years, one of the sons of Noah. Our fox, our fox said, lived 438 years. Selah lived 433 years. Eber lived 464. Peleg, 339. Reu, 239. Sirug, 230. Nahor, 148. Terah, the father of Abraham, 205. And Abraham, 175. Why was the age span of those who lived between the flood and the days of Abraham so significantly reduced? Well, there were several factors. Number one, they had a deteriorating body. In other words, their battery slowly was being discharged. Second, they lived in a very deteriorated environment as a result of the flood. Third, they openly violated the laws of health that could have conserved their vital energy. In other words, they wasted their battery. And finally, they had no access to the tree of life. They had no access to the battery charger. And that's why the ages were greatly reduced. Now, what about in the times of Moses? How long did people live in the days of Moses? Well, we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 7 that Moses lived 120 years. It says there, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural vigor diminished. 
Of course, Moses practiced laws of health. He was temperate, but he still did not have access to the tree of life. Therefore, he died when he was 120 years old. By the way, this is 1,000 years after the flood. What about in the days of David? How long were lifespans in the days of David? You see that lifespans are diminishing because human beings are further and further from the battery charger, from continuing to eat from the tree of life. Notice Psalm 90 and verse 10, where David tells us how long people lived in his day. This is how he wrote, he wrote, The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. So he says the days of our lives are what? Seventy years, and if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. In other words, we die. Now, God's plan was that man should live forever at the very beginning. Let's notice Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, where we're told that if Adam and Eve ate from the tree, they would die the very day that they ate from the tree. Notice Genesis 2 verse 17. God said to them, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God didn't tell Adam, Well, if you eat from the tree, you're going to die 930 years from now because he died when he was 930. No, that's not what God said. God said, the day that you eat from the tree, that day you're going to die. But Adam and Eve did not die that very day. So how do we understand this? Ah, there was a sacrifice on that day. And God covered the nakedness of Adam and Eve with the skins of the animals that were sacrificed. Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife... The Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. So there was a sacrifice that day. What was the meaning of the sacrifice of that animal? Probably a lamb. It represented the fact that in the future, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, was going to die on the cross. He was going to shed His blood, and then He would be able to cover us, cover the nakedness, the spiritual nakedness, with His righteousness. You say, how do we know this? Notice 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Here, Peter wrote, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now notice this. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. In other words, the death of Christ was already planned before this world existed. But then it says, but was manifest in these last times for you. In other words, Jesus actually came according to the plan that was devised in the ceaseless ages of eternity past. Ellen White wrote uh, the following very, very powerful words about the moment that Adam and Eve sinned. The instant, notice the instant, Adam yielded to Satan's temptation and did the very thing which God said he should not do. Christ, the Son of God, stood between the living and the dead, saying, Let the punishment fall on me. I will stand in man's place. Give him another trial. Transgression placed the whole world under the death sentence. But in heaven there was heard a voice saying, I have found a ransom. Beautiful. The instant that Adam and Eve sinned, Jesus stood between Adam and Eve and the Father and said, Father, I will die as the Lamb. I will pay their penalty. That's why they didn't die that very day, because Jesus offered His life that very day. In Revelation 13, verse 8, we find a verse that describes those who are not written in the book of life, those who will worship the beast at the end of time. And it tells us something very interesting there. I read Revelation 13, verse 8. 
all who dwell on the earth will worship him, that is the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Now we know from our perspective, Jesus was not slain before the foundation of the world. He was slain in the year 31 AD when he died on the cross. And yet, this is saying that the promise of redemption was made, according to this, from the foundation of the world. So, Adam and Eve were given hope. When Jesus came forth from the tomb and said, I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Therefore, we are not immortal by nature. We become immortal when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, and He imparts to us everlasting life. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. Notice what the Apostle Paul wrote. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Interesting. What did Jesus do? He abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, if we are by nature immortal, what good would it do for Jesus to bring life and immortality to light if we already had it? Now let's notice also Romans chapter 2 and verses 6 and 7. Romans chapter 2 verses 6 and 7. The Apostle Paul tells us here that we are supposed to seek for immortality. Folks, if we have to seek for immortality, we don't have it by nature. The Bible is clear on this point. Man is not immortal. Man doesn't have anything that's immortal except by accepting Christ, then we will have the guarantee of immortal life, immortality. Notice Romans 2, verses 6 and 7. Who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Why would we have to seek for immortality if by nature we already had it when God created us? It doesn't make any sense. And yet in spite of the fact that God has given us hope by bringing immortality to light through the gospel, and He said that it's, that it's possible to have immortality if we seek for it, human beings still die. If we have immortality in Christ through the gospel, and if we seek it, we find it, why do human beings still die? Folks, it's because we still do not have access to the tree of life. And eventually our body, our body dies. Our battery runs out. However, the good news is that all of this is going to change for those who have believed on Jesus Christ. Notice John chapter 6, verse 39, verse 40, and verse 44. Here Jesus is speaking and he says the following. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. So notice when immortality is going to be given, at the last day. Verse 40, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, so you can have everlasting life when you receive Jesus. But now notice, and I will raise him up at the last day. So we can have the guarantee of immortality when we accept Christ, but we only receive it tangibly and in person when Jesus comes. Notice verse 44. Here Jesus says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So if we receive Jesus, who is the spiritual tree of life, we have the guarantee of immortality when Jesus comes. I want you to notice this very interesting statement that's found in the book Heaven, also written by Ellen White. After the entrance of sin, the heavenly husbandman 
transplanted the tree of life to the paradise above. In other words, before the flood, the tree of life in the garden was taken to heaven. And we know that it's going to be restored according to Revelation 22. We'll come to that in a few moments. So once again, after the entrance of sin, the heavenly husbandman transplanted the tree of life to the paradise above. But now notice, but its branches hang over the wall to the lower world. Through the redemption purchased by the blood of Christ, we may, may still eat of its life-giving fruit. It's speaking spiritually, not literally. Of course, there's not literal branches hanging over the wall of the New Jerusalem down to the earth. No, it means that Jesus has come to this earth. We can receive Him as our Savior, and in this way we receive immortality, the guarantee of immortality. When will we receive the final touch of immortality? That which Jesus has guaranteed when He came to live and die for us, and which He offers to those who receive Christ as Savior. 1 Corinthians chapter, 5, uh, chapter 15 and verses 52 and 53 tell us when we shall receive the touch of immortality. If we're going to receive it when Jesus comes, we don't have it right now, folks. We have the guarantee of it, but we don't actually possess it. There's nothing that flies away from the body at the moment of death because it's immortal. Notice what we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 52 and 53. Here the Apostle Paul wrote, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means we're not all going to die. There's going to be some who will be alive when Jesus comes. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. In other words, we'll be like Adam and Eve before they sinned. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Folks, if we have to put on immortality, we don't have it right now. It's that simple. The Bible is clear. So once again, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? I once was talking with a friend who believes that the soul of man is immortal. And I asked him, do you believe that man by nature is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent? In other words, do you believe that man is all-powerful, he knows all things, and he's present everywhere? And of course, immediately he looked at me and says, of course not. Those qualities belong only to God. So then I asked him a second question. Is man's nature immortal? He said, yes. But I said, wait, wait a minute. Immortality is one of those attributes that belong to God alone by nature. Just like omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. So why do you say that immortality belongs to uh, everyone when the Bible says that only God has immortality. And you say, well, where does the Bible say that? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 13 to 17. 1 Timothy 6, 13 to 17. Here the apostle Paul wrote, I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which He will manifest in His own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, now don't miss the next point in verse 16, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and Lord of lords who alone has immortality. What does alone mean? It means that no one else by nature possesses it. So once again, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So when will the faithful receive the touch of immortality? It's when Jesus returns the second time. 
this corruptible would put on incorruption, and this mortal will put on immortality. And then God's people once again will live in Eden, where the tree of life is. And God's people will be able to eat from the tree of life and live forever and continue eating on a regular basis. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. Here we are told that when we enter the New Jerusalem, after the resurrection, or after our translation from among the living, when we have been transformed from corruptible to incorruptible, and from mortal to immortal, we once again will live in a land where there is no death. It says there in Revelation 21 verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor crying, nor sorrow. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. We will live in a world where there is no longer any death, according to the Bible. And how will we continue living? Will we then be by nature immortal? Will we have immortal life that no one could ever take from us? Absolutely not. We will have to continue eating from the tree of life. You say, what? Let's go to Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. There are two very interesting points that we find uh, in these verses. It says there, For as the new heavens and the new earth, the same expression that we find in the book of Revelation, as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Now some people get all hung up on that expression, one new moon to another. They say, how is it that we're going to celebrate the new moons? Wasn't that part of the ceremonial system of the Old Testament? Well, let me just mention that the expression new moon simply means the beginning of the month was marked by the new moon. So a perfectly proper translation would be from month to month. In other words, from month to month, God's people will come to worship before the Lord. Incidentally, the Spanish versions translate de mes en mes. They translate from month to month, not from luna nueva to luna nueva. So we need to understand that God's people are going to worship before the Lord every month, but not only every month. Let me just uh, add this little sidelight in verse 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh, not the Jews, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Now we know why God's faithful people are going to worship before the Lord from Sabbath to Sabbath on a regular basis. It's because God, before sin at the beginning, before there was any Jew, He established the Sabbath as the day for man to rest. And the Sabbath day as the rest day is going to be restored in the world to come. Most Christians today observe Sunday as a day of worship. The Bible tells us that the day to commemorate creation, the day to commemorate redemption when Jesus rested in the tomb, and the way to look forward to the new heavens and the new earth is by observing the seventh day Sabbath. And that's what this text is telling us. Now, why are we going to go from month to month to worship before the Lord? That's a very important question. Well, it's because in the city will be the tree of life that produces its fruit every month. Notice Revelation 22, verses 1 and 2. Here John is in vision, and this is what he wrote. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street... And on either side of the river, I'm going to explain what that means. On either side of the river was the tree of life, 
So the tree of life is on both sides of the river. And you're saying, now, uh, then that would be two trees of life. No, I'm going to explain it in a few moments. So notice, it says, in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And now notice, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So when does this tree produce its fruit? It produces its fruit every month. And we are going to worship before the Lord, how frequently? Every month, as well as every Sabbath, according to what we read in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 and 23. Now there's a very interesting little detail here. It says the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now here's the question. When we are raised immortal and incorruptible, are we going to need healing? Well, people would say, of course not. Why would we need healing if we're incorruptible and immortal when we've been resurrected or when we've been translated from among the living? And yet it's interesting, the word that is used here for healing is the word therapeia, where we get the word therapy. And it's used in the Bible to speak about healing. And virtually every translation that I consulted says that the tree, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. How do we understand this? Well, the best explanation I have been able to find is in the Great Controversy, the book, The Great Controversy, page 644. When the righteous resurrect, they will be the same size that they were while they lived on this earth. They will be immortal and incorruptible, yes. In other words, they will have everlasting life, never to die again. But they will resurrect the same size that they were when they went into the tomb. And you say, well, are they going to say, stay that size? No. Great Controversy 644 says, speaking about those who resurrect the righteous, all come forth from their graves, the same in stature as when they entered the tomb. So at the resurrection, everyone will resurrect the same size that they were when they were alive. But now notice, restored to the tree of life, in the long lost Eden, the redeemed will grow up to the full stature of the race in its primeval glory. So that is the healing of the leaves of the tree, is for God's people to grow up to the size and stature of the original race. That will be the therapy. The therapy is not from death to life. The therapy is for people to grow to the height of the original race. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. It speaks there once again about the tree of life. Somebody might say, well, you know, uh, Revelation 22 says that the tree of life produces its fruit every month, but it doesn't say that we're going to eat from it. Well, Revelation 2 verse 7 says that we're going to eat from it, and we know it's from month to month, and the reason why is because the tree produces its fruit every month. Revelation 2 and verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, now listen carefully, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And folks, eating from the tree of life and continually going from month to month, our energy will be rekindled. Our energy will be once again strengthened. And as long as we continue eating from the tree of life throughout eternity, we will continue living, but the life will not be inherent. It will not belong to us. It will be contingent upon God's tree, which when we eat of it, strengthens the battery that God has given us at the resurrection. Let's go to Revelation 22 and verses 14 and 15. What are the conditions for being inside or outside of the holy city? We just read that he who overcomes, Jesus will give to eat from the tree of life. Now, how did the righteous get in there and why are the wicked outside the city? Revelation 22 verses 14 and 15 tells us why. Blessed are those who do his commandments. I know other versions read, who washed their robes. Uh, I don't have time to get into that right now, 
but I believe the best translation is, Blessed are those who do His commandments. Now notice, that they may have the right to the tree of life. What gives you a right to the tree of life? Keeping the commandments. And some people say, well, that's legalism, Pastor. That's saying that you believe that you're saved because of your works. No, no, no. Your works show if you're saved. Your works don't sa uh, save you. But if there are no works corresponding to our profession of Christ, it's an indication that we haven't been saved. There's a danger of putting the cart before the horse, in other words. So it says, blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Those who are who are inside, overcome, and it says here that they do God's commandments, who are outside. But outside are dogs, and sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. By the way, all of those are transgressions of the Ten Commandments. Sorcery would be a violation of the commandment, uh, the first commandment. You should have no other gods before me because they claim to have a power that is beyond human power. Uh, sexually immoral would be the seventh commandment. Murderers would be the sixth commandment. Idolaters would be the second commandment. And whoever loves and practices a lie, that would be the commandment that says you shall not bear false witness. So outside are the commandment breakers, inside are the commandment keepers. And they kept God's commandments not to earn salvation, they kept God's commandments because they loved Jesus, and it is an evidence of their salvation. Ellen White described the tree of life, why it had two uh, trunks, one on one side and the other on the other side of the river. In early writings, page 17, she wrote, she was taken there in vision, by the way. Here we saw the tree of life and the throne of God. Out of the throne came a pure river of water, and on either side of the river was the tree of life. On one side of the river was a trunk of a tree, and a trunk on the other side of the river, both of pure transparent gold. At first I thought I saw two trees. I looked again and saw that they were united at the top in one tree. In other words, it's like an arch. So it was the tree of life on either side of the river of life. Its branches bowed to the place where we stood, and the fruit was glorious. It looked like gold mixed with silver. Now, folks, how can we have this glorious hope of being inside the New Jerusalem, and eating from the tree of life from month to month throughout eternity future, and going from week to week on Sabbath to Sabbath to worship before the Lord Jesus. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, we are told, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So eternal life is being in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice that this verse does not say the wages of sin is everlasting life in misery, but the free gift of God is everlasting life in bliss. The contrast is not between living eternally in happiness and living eternally in sadness and sorrow and crying out because you're burning in the fires of hell. No, the Choice is between eternal life and eternal death. Now, how can we be sure to be inside the city and have everlasting life? The most famous verse in the Bible is in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The condition is believing in Jesus. And it doesn't mean just believing intellectually because James tells us that even the devils believe and tremble. Does Satan believe that Jesus lived a perfect life? Of course. Does Satan believe that Jesus died on the cross? Of course. Does he believe that he was buried and that he resurrected, that he went to heaven? The devil believes all of those things. But he does not have a trusting, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the author of evil. He hates the Lord Jesus. So to believe in Jesus means to trust in Him. It means to follow Him. It means to obey Him because we love Him. And by the way, if we do, 
then we are in Christ, and we will be resurrected if we die before Jesus comes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17 is beautiful. The Apostle Paul is talking about the second coming of Christ. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. The living are not going to heaven before the dead, in other words. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and now notice this, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So you can die in Christ or you can die outside of Christ. Who are the ones that are going to be taken to heaven? The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. You know, people ask me, they say, Pastor Bohr, aren't you afraid of traveling on airplanes? You know, I used to travel uh, before the coronavirus uh, many, many times a month. And people say, aren't you afraid of flying? I say, no, not really. Why should I be afraid? Oh, well, because the, the plane might fall out of the sky. I say, well, yeah, and what's the problem? Oh, well, the, then you would die. And I say, well, what's the problem? <laughs> You're not afraid of dying? Not really, because the Bible tells me that if I'm in Christ, He's going to resurrect me. I'm only going to take a short siesta in the grave. In Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27, we're told about how we can be in Christ so that we can be absolutely certain that if we die, Jesus will resurrect us when He comes. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, we're told, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So when you receive Jesus by faith, when you trust in Him, when you give your life to Him, and only to Him, then the Bible says that you are in Christ and you will be baptized. And that's the incorporation ceremony into Christ. God no longer looks at us. He looks at Christ who represents us. Final text. We can have eternal life now as a guarantee. But what is the key for having that guarantee? 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Notice it doesn't say He will give us. It says He has given us eternal life. And it's not by nature, because it continues saying, and this life is in His Son. Well, if eternal life is in His Son, then we don't have it inherently as human beings. Verse 12 tells us, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So people who have not received Jesus, they might have existence, but not life. Not eternal life. Not the life that will never end. The guarantee that Jesus gives us, and which He will implement when He comes. May that be our glorious hope. <laughs> 